What's the biggest lie that your that your clients believe? Time heals all wounds. They don't believe that. No, they do. They they think that time will heal all wounds, and I don't. incredible human being. I'll let her tell you all about the amazing work that she does, but let's just put our hands together in welcoming Tori Gordon. My name is Tori Gordon, and I am a high-performance coach and breathwork facilitator. I run a podcast called The Coachable Podcast, and I really help people build lives that feel as good as they look. Because I was somebody for a long time who had a life that looked really good, but didn't feel good on the inside. I've lived in the penthouse condo on the beach. I've dated the Major League Baseball player. I've bought the house at 25 years old. I've done a lot of nice things that on the outside look really good, but it didn't feel good. I was alone. I was lonely, even in crowded rooms like this sometimes. I was unfulfilled, I was lacking purpose. But how did I get here? I grew up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which is home of Alabama football, Roll Tide. <laughs> That's why we bleed crimson. Are you an actual football? Yeah, I tried out for the middle school football team. What position? I didn't know, I made it to tryouts and I worked out with the team and then they gave me the helmet and I couldn't really hold the helmet up. It was so heavy. I remember having this very serious talk with the coach and being like so devastated. It's like, coach, I'm not going to be able to play like <laughs> for whatever reason. Yeah, but yeah, I'm a big sports fan for sure. Why, why football? That doesn't even... It was just part of the culture. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't. I was a three sport athlete other than football. <laughs> that wasn't one of my sports. But yeah, I've always been super competitive. It's interesting, like thinking about my name once we did that name exercise and looking up the meaning of my name and stuff and it's all about obviously victory and conquering and winning so I've always been pretty competitive. I grew up in a very nuclear family, had an amazing childhood. My parents were both musicians. My mom was a classical pianist and professor at the university. My dad was um, and still is an amazing writer and producer and also a professor. He owns his own record label and um, has traveled all over the world with some of the biggest names in music, some like the Temptations, the OJs, the Four Tops. He's, he played in their, their horn section for years and still does. So yeah, very musical family. Um, and had an older sister, Anna, who's four years older than me. It was cool, we were both athletic. We played sports together. When I was in middle school, I'd play up on the high school team and she would pitch. And so we shared common interests in certain ways. Um, and we were both competitive with each other, for sure, in school and sports and anything. But she was amazing. She was, she was the one that was really interested in psychology and Spanish and different cultures and different languages. And I didn't realize how much of an impact that made on me until later in my life when I was starting to now find interest in those things. So I've sort of mirrored a lot of her path um, as I've gotten older, which has been kind of fascinating. I feel like I connect with her so much more now than I did when I was younger. When I was a senior in high school, my sister was diagnosed with leukemia and she was four years older than me. I had the opportunity to share this with Mike earlier and I appreciate you for holding space. Um, and that was the first thing that really rocked our family. I grew up in a very nuclear family, loving parents, and that was the thing that shook us. It was the first disruption, it was the first hit in Coachable, and in my programs I call this the hit, it's the trauma, it's the thing that you don't see coming. It's the bankruptcy, it's the divorce, it's the diagnosis, it's the call that you didn't expect. And that was the beginning of a 10-year journey of back to back to back hits. It was a string of events that happened in my life over the course of about 10 years, um, which caused me to live in a, a hypervigilant state. I was living in survival. 
And I didn't know it at the time, but I was just doing what I had to do to make it through. So in 2011, there was actually a massive F4 tornado that came through our hometown and killed hundreds of people. And it wiped out, I mean, our entire city and it devastated our home and our community and we had to rebuild. Um, yeah, so there are storms that come through life, physically and like literally and metaphorically. And um, so that was the big impact. That was the first big event that happened. And then two weeks later, we had to take my sister off life support. And so I watched this beautiful, vibrant life make this transition, which was really a holy moment to experience. And so I started to have all these questions about who am I and why am I here and what am I meant to do? And, and then that Christmas, my grandmother passed away that Christmas morning. I woke up on Christmas morning when I found out my grandmother passed away. Lost my grandfather, my other grandmother and my uncle. And then my mom was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer. So in the span of a few years, I lost five of my immediate, six of my immediately fa immediate family members and my mom passed 10 days after my 27th birthday. A lot of times we come to these events and we talk a lot about the future, about what we're gonna do when we go home, about our plan, about our strategy. But what if there was nothing that you needed to do right now but just be here? Because a lot of times we approach life from this perspective that we need to do something in order to be someone so that we can have what we think we want. And the things that we think we want, the things that we desire, what I've realized is a lot of times I'm not really desiring the thing as much as I'm desiring the feeling that I think it's going to give me. Right? So we're after a feeling. Presence, which you just experienced, possibly by looking at somebody in the eye, is a connection. And presence is the prerequisite for connection. So you have to be here. That's when I started to look in the mirror and be like, okay, how do I pick up the pieces now? It was like that storm came and threw all this emotional debris around. And it's like, okay, now, now what? How do we rebuild? How do we move forward? Because you don't move on, you move forward. And that process was looking at um, all of the ways in which I looked at life and said it shouldn't be this way. That's wrong, it shouldn't have happened, why? And I realized that the way that I was living was in conflict with life, in conflict with what was the truth. And part of my healing and my transformation in the work that I do now is helping people and helping myself come into acceptance of life as it is and not, what if I didn't need to change anything? What if nothing is actually wrong? And what typically we do when a storm comes through is we go out and we clean up. Yet no one tells us how to clean up after an emotional storm. So what do we do? It stays there. And then the next thing happens. We go away to college. Maybe we have our first heartbreak. Maybe we drop out. Maybe we have bankruptcy. Whatever the issue is. And then the next storm comes through and it leaves more emotional debris. And I was hearing somebody else talk about how that feeling of overwhelm is real. And a lot of times it's because there's so much emotional debris that we've never learned to clean up that has got us up to here. I had started listening to podcast, personal development podcasts at the time because I was seeking, I was like looking for answers and tools. And um, it's one of those times where you're like, you're in the darkness. You're like, you're just like feeling around for anything that feels stable. And this woman was offering a retreat and it was one of those deep knowings. It was like, oh, that I'm supposed to be there, you know? And I had been thinking about it. An opportunity um, came up for me to go and I just, I said yes. And I went to Maui, traveled alone. And it was on that retreat that it was like, this is the work that not just I've been avoiding, because I didn't even know I needed it at the time, but it was like, this is, this is the path forward. This is, this is the road to healing and it's going to require you to feel 
the things you've been unwilling to feel. My path to healing and change and transformation, which is what this conference is all about, um, didn't come as a byproduct of avoiding hard things. You cannot heal what you're not willing to feel. And I can look at the people I know I've had the pleasure of, of getting to know this week and I can see and I can sense that you know what I'm talking about. The only thing that's gonna heal you is love applied to the wounded places. So we've got to be willing to bring presence to the pain, clear out the emotional debris, find the helpers. I mean, I help people in trans big transitions that are in uncertainty, that are making hard decisions about what direction to go in. And I think I have this ability to hold space for people in their darkness and in their uncertainty and hold the frame that there is, you can get out of it. There is a path forward. Where you are is okay. And sometimes that's all we need to know. It's that we always like, okay, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Getting where? You've only ever been here. You've only ever been in the present moment. You've never been in your future. So just be here. And can I be in acceptance of what is instead of in resistance to it? Because I promise once you release the need to change something or fix something or make it different, an energy will release that actually allows you to be with it. And from that space, you can create something new. Oh, this is lived experience. Yeah, I think that's why it lands with people. I think that's why when people get it, they get it. Because it's like, oh, she's not telling me something that sounds good. Um, you know, it's, at this point, it's embodied. It's, it's, it's the truth as I see it and as I've experienced it. And for those that are in that space, um, it's helpful to find a reference point for what they can, they're looking for anything to cling on to. And so when you can hear from somebody who can give you a perspective that maybe you didn't have before and that can give you hope, ultimately, that things get better, that there's, that you will find healing and that there, you can find peace amidst chaos. Like that's, that's the whole idea and it's about for me, the reason I love coaching is because I get to share my experience. I get to say, hey, this is what's worked for me. Try it on. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't, that's okay too, you know? But I think it's useful because um, the things that I've learned and that I use are useful for me. So they tend to, tend to help the people that try, try them too. Time doesn't heal all wounds. It's a lie that we've been told. <laughs> I mean, it's, I think it's this lie that we've been told. It's like, oh, it's okay, just give it time. And what we're really saying is just, if we can create enough distance from it, then I'll forget the feeling. It won't be as visceral, it won't be as intense. And that might be true, but it hasn't healed. So if we really want to heal, what I have learned is that we can't heal what we hate. So I've got to find some level of ability to be with it and not make it wrong, not make it bad. Can I just be neutral with it? And then apply love to it and compassion to it. Because time doesn't heal all wounds. I think love applied to those wounded places is what heals us. You know, finding love for ourselves and compassion for ourselves in our brokenness.